So this presentation is about air quality in the ART laboratory. The air quality is a key aspect of designing a modern uh, ART lab. It's obviously the, the environment of the lab on, the, on a macro scale. The micro scale is what's inside the incubators and the culture system, but the, the macro scale is the, is the lab itself. And in terms of what we have to be concerned about, the air quality itself in terms of the HVAC system, we've got to worry about particulates, microbials, VOCs. Um, we've got the cleaning of the workstations uh, and what that might release into the, the room. We've got floor cleaning, uh, which obviously is, is a risk of VOCs, as well as VOCs inside the incubators and in the cultures uh, coming off from the plastic wear, uh, et cetera. So the lab environment is, is not just a, a simple thing. It, it's a complex environment that needs to be carefully controlled, but it needs to be more than just controlled. It's also how it's set up in the first place. It's how it's designed. And there's been a, a lot of discussion about this. And so uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Jacques Cohen and I co convened a consensus meeting uh, in Cairo, one of the uh, Upper Egypt uh, symposia. And it was published in IBM Online, and you can see the article there, and you can see the, uh, uh, the photograph of all the uh, participants. This was a meeting of international experts, uh, including uh, perhaps Jacques and myself, but also particularly Antonio Gilligan, who's one of the world's leading experts on, on air quality for uh, IVF labs. And our goal was to establish a consensus on the recommended technical and operational requirements for air quality within modern ART laboratories. So as I said, it's not just about setting uh, setting things up is how you run them as well that controls the whole thing so the consensus points from that meeting should be considered as aspirational benchmarks for existing ART labs and as guidelines to the construction of new ART labs so when you're running an ART center it's you were concerned about the procedural suite not just the lab by procedural suite I mean the whole area covered by that HVAC system that includes the, the embryology laboratory. So it usually includes the embryology lab, perhaps a clean andrology lab, but typically also the procedure room as well. And you must always remember that what happens in the procedure room directly affects the embryology lab because the return air from the procedure room is mixed in with the return air from the lab and it will be shared as it comes back out on the next cycle. So you have to see the whole suite as the unit, not just the lab. <clears throat> So, the fact is we need to consider all the design and construction of the facilities, heating, ventilation and air conditioning, which is the HVAC system. We want to control particulates, microorganisms, volatile organic compounds within the critical areas. We start with selecting the construction materials and the construction methods to minimize VOCs and other contaminating agents, including particulates, right from the very beginning. Once the place is built, we have to concerned about having safe cleaning practices to protect gametes and embryos from toxins. Our operational practices uh, need to optimize air quality while minimizing physical chemical risks to gametes and embryos. And here we're looking at the balance between temperature control versus airflow. This is temperature control of the cultures, not the room. Infection control practices is another factor where we want to minimize exposure to VOCs. And this is things like the cult sterilizers, glutrolyhyde for ultrasound probes, for example, surface cleaners, hand sanitizers, etc. If you don't have a clean room type ART lab, there's a number of issues that can impact the operation and the outcomes. If it's a non-clean room lab, you typically have don't have a complete isolation from your surroundings. One example here is that the return airflow return airflow would go through the plenum space. That's the sort of the dead space above the ceiling before the concrete slab of the floor above, which is what most office type buildings will use for the return air. We have in, inadequate positive pre pressurization to prevent the flow of dirty air into the lab. Positive pressurization is always greatest in the embryology lab so that there's always an outflow of air from the embryology lab, not an an inflow of air from other air areas, even within the clean room. If you don't have a clean room lab, you typically will have uh, insufficient or non-robust chemical filtration or removal uh, due to incorrect filter types or using activated charcoal on its own. Uh, 
PCO systems will uh, only result in partial oxida oxidation of VOCs at each pass, so you will have incomplete oxidation of some organics, and that might create some aldehydes, for example. And you typically are not monitoring your HVAC system in a non-cleaning environment. The ability of the air in the HVAC system in non-clean room spaces is it also often able to bypass the filters due to poor pressure monitoring, uh, lack of supporting frames of filters, inadequate maintenance, etc. And inadequate, sorry, inappropriate materials are often used in construction. Here, like uh, cabinetry made of MDF, medium density fiberboard, or using linoleum for floor covering, or oil coated ductwork, and the oil coating is used for rust prevention, or formaldehyde urea insulation. You often have a contaminated or compromised source of fresh air supply, and examples from the real world include uh, having built labs where the uh, fresh air intake is in the shipping dock, or it's near the helipad, near the lovely smell of, uh, of uh, aircraft fuel in the, in the lab every time the helicopter lands or takes off. Or you have designs which make maintenance difficult or impossible. For example, some places might locate the air handling unit and the chemical filters inside the ceiling space of the lab, and that's very difficult to get at to uh, maintain. If you're designing a new ART lab, there's three things you really need to understand and think about before you even start. The first is how all the aspects of the laboratory environment can impact gametes and embryo biology. And the second part is about HVAC system and plane room standards. And in this case, the CARA consensus compared to the ISO standard, and we'll come back to that in a moment. In terms of designing the facility, we've got to think about the ergonomics for optimal lab configuration and layout. We have to think about the space adjacencies and physical isolation of the lab. We've got to specify the HVAC system as per the consensus, which we'll discuss in a moment. We've got to control the VOCs, starting with the fabric of the laboratory, how it was constructed. When we're operating the facility, a big concern here is minimizing the VOCs that might get into the culture system. We've got to avoid introducing VOCs into the lab. We have to decrease the ambient VOCs in the lab because they come from the plastic ware, the staff, whatever. And we have to decrease the VOCs specifically inside the incubators in the cultures. If you go for one of these really very high spec clean rooms, there are some risks. I mentioned the ISO standard before, the ISO 14644 part one, uh, last reviewed 2015, which means it's probably under review again right now. Uh, it's about clean rooms and associated controlled environments. And part one is about classification of air cleanliness by particle concentration. The three other parts are that same ISO standard, but part one is what affects us right now. You need to know that high specification ISO classes like class five, they require very high airflow in terms of air changes per hour, which is usually abbreviated as ACH, and a high percentage ceiling filter coverage. So if you want to go to ISO class five, which is like a, a class 100 clean room, uh, which is very clean, it's like a, a laminar flow operating theater, for example, the recommended air changes and ceiling coverage for class five is 240 to 600 air changes per hour. That's more than a gentle breeze. And the ceiling coverage is 35 to 70%, which means that the recommendation is that between a third and two thirds of the ceiling area is actually HEPA filters. So that's a very difficult thing to achieve. It makes these sorts of high spec clean rooms expensive, impractical for our purposes as, as for ART labs, and the high airflow is hazardous to oocytes and embryos due to the risk of excessive cooling effects caused by that breeze. That breeze is only room temperature air by definition. So the CARA consensus recommendations started off by saying that we would recommend an air particulates level of about equivalent to ISO class 7. And that the microbials are about the same. Our VOCs are a much bigger concern. Now, VOCs are not even mentioned in the ISO standard, so this is something that's different. So you can build an ISO class 5 clean room and have no VOC treatment, and you've got a very clean space, doesn't do you much good, can do a lot of harm, and you haven't even thought about the VOCs, which are the most harmful thing compared to the particulates. So we set levels of VOCs. Air changes per hour, we're recommending about 15 total air changes per hour, which includes about three fresh air changes per hour. So that means about 20% fresh air each cycle, which means 80% of the air gets recirculated. This 
makes it cheaper to run in terms of not having to keep purifying and conditioning the uh, in terms of temperature all the fresh air. In terms of overpressure, which again is not uh, the same as an ISO standard, the ideal target is between 38 and 50 pascals positive pressure in the IVF lab. The minimum should be plus 30 pascals and for a, a, a modern facility. And to achieve this, you use a cascade of overpressure across several rooms. So you are trying to go from ambient to plus 50 pascals. It makes the doors quite hard to open. Um, so you have a, a series of two or three rooms in order to get to that space. In terms of temperature, you maintain a stable range that's comfortable to the staff and allows the equipment to function properly. So typically that's between 20 and 24 degrees Celsius. Temperature controlled equipment can't control a temperature of about 37 degrees if the temperature is about 30 degrees because there's not enough differential for them to operate properly. Uh, whether you choose 20 or 24, whatever, it depends on the region. Some places have it cooler, some places that go to the warmer end. Very warm rooms are uncomfortable and for, to work in and people tend to just want to get out of them. So they're paying less attention to what they're doing, which is definitely not good for an IVF lab. And this temperature control is achieved via the HVAC system, not via separate heating systems. Uh, so no baseboard heaters, no radiators, that sort of stuff, because they're all just more complicated things to try and keep clean. Humidity, a relative humidity level of between 40 and 45 percent is recommended. If it's drier, it makes it even harder to set up your dishes um, and you get more rapid evaporation. If it's more humid, then you're going to uh, increase the risk of uh, fungal spores uh, developing and having uh, molds in the space. So 40 to 45 percent is a, is a good place to be. In terms of general criteria for designing your HVAC system, it needs to be dedicated air handling unit to avoid the return of contaminated air from other spaces. You've got to have adequate provision for heating and cooling of the incoming fresh air according to your local climatic requirements. If it's if you're in uh, Calgary in the middle of the winter, you need to warm it up substantially, perhaps by um, 60 degrees Celsius. And if you're in uh, and somewhere like Doha, you'll need to cool it down because it can get to 50 degrees outdoors. The HVAC system needs to run constantly. You can't just run it during working hours. It just these systems don't function that way. At a minimum, the HVAC fans should be on generator backup as well, so it will stay running even if you have a power failure. You need to locate the fresh air intake away from obvious source of noxious fumes, so not in loading docks, not near the helipad, and you need to pre-filter the incoming air to optimize your functional life of your uh, high-grade filters in the clean room. Use a high level of recirculation to minimize the circulating VOC levels and to reduce the energy costs like heating and cooling. And you need also to be able to isolate the system from the outside world. And this is often called submarine mode uh, in case you have an emergency situation outdoors like a bushfire or a sandstorm or something more everyday like someone um, re tarmacking the parking lot next door to your building. So you, in those situations, you will need to be able to isolate the clean room. You will probably lose the ability to maintain the overpressure, but at least you won't be putting the contaminants into your space. In terms of the air supply vents, they go in the ceiling and the return air ducts draw from close to floor level, usually towards the corners of the rooms or in the middle of the, of the wall as well, if it's a big, a big space. Beware of drafts from air vents affecting equipment. So if the air, air vent is in the ceiling, don't locate it above, your, above bench top incubators. You need to ideally locate the HEPA filter centrally to avoid needing to access multiple locations within the ART suite when changing them. Regardless of the VOC elimination technology that you use, uh, you need to include an activated carbon and permanganate filter downstream of all air handling, but before the HEPA filter. And the residence time on this filter should be about 0.2 to 0.35 seconds. So even if you're using PCO or plasma technology, you'll still need some other filters because stuff can still get through those and you need to be just sure that you're controlling those. You should have pressure sensors and differential pressure displays each side of each doorway going into or out of the ART suite and also between areas within the ART suite. The exterior walls of the suite must run slab to slab. Seal all the perforations. You're creating a sealed box. And that means that the ceiling needs to be solid 
contiguous ceilings, so not ceiling tiles, and they even minimize access panels. And the access panels that must be there for whatever reason need to have airtight silicone gaskets to stop the air leakage. In terms of general construction criteria, thoroughly clean the AHU and the, all the ductwork to remove corrosion prevention treatments before installation. Seal all the ductwork joints, for example, using water-based silicone, and also seal them externally using metal tape around the outside. You'll see this metal tape, so it's silver shiny stuff, and you see that on all the HVAC ductware ducts, you'll see. Seal the perimeter of the clean room suites, uh, including the door seals and sweeps so that the, the doors aren't a source of leakage. Small leaks will, will typically make whistling noises, so you'll, you'll notice if they've not been found. The, any pass-throughs must be airtight and have double doors to preserve air pressure differentials. Light fittings must be airtight to avoid air leakage into the plenum space. So you, if you could use a surface mounted uh, is, is best if you can and with the modern LED panels it's much easier than it used to be. Um, the cable access needs to be sealed and there must be no horizontal rim or flange uh, of, the, of any light fittings where dirt can accumulate. If you're using downlighter type fittings they must be special ones for clean rooms to stop the air going through the, fit, through the fitting into the space above the uh, fixed ceiling. Your electrical, gas and data conduits must be sealed where they enter or leave the clean room to prevent air loss through them. And that means things like behind your light switches needs to be sealed. Behind any power points in the wall needs to be sealed. Your gas connections need to be, where the gas piping comes through the wall, needs to be sealed or ideally run within this, these conduits. Within the suite, use a wall-mounted steel trunking for distribution of the power data and, and lab gases. So this is surface mounted. Yes, there will probably a little shelf on the top, but that's easy to clean. And ideally it should be a, 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 at a 45 degree angle. Hand washing facilities should typically be located in vestibules rather than in ART labs. And waste pipes on these sinks need to have traps. So a vestibule is usually one of your low pressure airs inside the clean room, but it's not inside the embryology lab. Drenched showers are not needed in these sorts of labs because there's no noxious or corrosive chemicals. But sometimes building codes require them. And if that's the case, then make sure that the, uh, the trap underneath them is not allowed to dry out. So you need to uh, run them, test them regularly and make sure the system doesn't dry properly or even just pour some water down to make sure the, uh, tap stay, the trap stays wet. If installed inside the lab, the fire suppression system, sprinklers, uh, should be protected from accidental triggering from outside the lab. You don't want a paper fire in a nearby office area to set the sprinklers inside the lab and destroy half a million dollars of equipment, for example. You need to avoid unnecessary plumbing in the ceiling plenum space. This is the space above your fixed ceiling, but if, you, if the plumbing there leaks, it's a source of flooding and potential contamination of your clean room, and it's complex and expensive to remediate afterwards. In terms of construction materials, for the walls, you can use either modular clean room panels or plasterboard with zero VOC paint. For the floors, sheet vinyl with welded joints, Avoid using linoleum and other things like that because they can be embryotoxic. For the crow areas, where you can have liquid nitrogen spilling on the floor, uh, you need to use a non-thermally fragile floor covering, and, and that really limits you to something like stainless steel tread plate. If you leave bare concrete, then that will still suffer damage, and you may end up having structural damage to the floor in the long term. For the ceilings, plasterboard set ceilings is typical, and essential access panels, as I said, are gasketed and sealed at the ceiling and at the frame of any door access panel that's in them. Windows, glass is preferred and gasketed. Uh, any windows to the outdoors need filters to exclude UV light. Large observation windows into the lab are difficult to seal effectively. Uh, if you really want to have one of those, then probably do it with several smaller windows rather than one huge one. Windows would normally be mounted indoors and kept small. Because again, windows are potentially a way of getting through a door if somebody breaks a glass. So again, it should be a security glass. In terms of the lab furniture, under and over bench cabinets, ideally powder coated metal or stainless steel. Uh, avoid manufactured wood products, things like MDF and, and things like Formica. For the countertops, use non-porous materials that do not release VOCs, things like epoxy, corium, Trespa. And for the paint that you use, zero VOC paint only. Avoid all base paints uh, due to the embryotoxicity of the fumes that come off them. If you've built your facility, you're going to commission it. You need a, a burn-in period 
it's not three months like people used to say if you've designed it properly and built it properly but for newly constructed or renovated even renovated labs you need to allow some adequate time for off gassing of the construction materials the time this takes will depend on the location of the space and the materials used it might require several weeks so you should allow at least two to three weeks in your construction schedule for this to happen um, but I say it does not need to be two or three months with, uh, with careful selection of materials and building methods. Uh, you need to verify by specific VOC testing uh, to provide a comparison with the baseline to, that the burn-in has been effective. And remember things like a human sperm survival test as a bioassay are just not sufficient for this purpose. Human sperm are not really sensitive to VOCs or neither sensitive to endotoxins, so they're not a particularly useful test in this purpose. After the burn-in, you do a deep clean. This is an intensive cleaning prior to validating for clinical use. Every surface, including all the hard-to-reach corners, inside the cupboards and drawers, and underneath these things as well, must be cleaned. All the equipment's cleaned, inside and out. Use the products that are capable of removing all expected contaminants. Then you clean again to make sure that the cleaning agents themselves have been removed. The next four slides cover ongoing VOC management in your facility because it is one of the most critical areas. The HVAC system needs to be serviced annually or if its performance fails to meet expectations, you have to service it more often. When we talk about designing it to achieve ISO class seven or thereabouts, we usually recommend designing it in terms of its capabilities to achieve at least one effective level higher. Because if you design it to uh, something like ISO 7, then it has to be running top of the line to stay that way uh, on an ongoing basis, where if you design it to one step up, then it's easy to maintain the minimum level you expect it to be at. You must not use aldehyde-based cult sterilizers within the ART suite. That's anywhere where the air is recirculating that could take those vapors back into the embryology lab, because they are highly embryotoxic. So your, your gas units need to be located where there's no risk of their vapors contaminating the area in the ART suite. Infection control measures that might be routine elsewhere, for example, if you're in a hospital, might not be appropriate and can even be detrimental because they're embryotoxic. So infection control procedure, uh, products, such as hand sanitizers, must be evaluated prior to use in the ART suite. In terms of cleaning, uh, chlorine dioxide or bleach is not appropriate during clinical operations. You could use that uh, for your cleans in your downtimes, but uh, not best thing to use when you've got embryos around the place. Uh, we recommend cleaning with 6% uh, peroxide rather than alcohol or isopropyl alcohol um, because it's much lower embryo toxicity. Uh, care must always be taken not to expose embryos to the sterilizing agent or its residues. Um, obviously, you don't use things like peroxide to clean culture dishes. They're already sterile. Um, you just want to make sure they don't get into your culture system. But they're perfectly good for cleaning the surfaces because peroxide breaks down to oxygen and water vapor and, and water, so you don't have any contaminants. Avoid cleaning products, air fresheners, cosmetics, grooming products such as perfume, aftershave, nail polish, etc., that release VOCs. This includes hand washing and sanitizing products and hand lotions, etc. Not just amongst the patients, but the staff as well. Laundry, laundry detergents that are used for cleaning scrubs should be ones that don't release VOCs because they will come out with the scrubs. You need a perfume-free environment. If your clinical procedure room is within the ART suite, then patients must not wear any skincare, cosmetics, or grooming products during procedures. And if the partner is present, he shouldn't be wearing them either. If they are, you need to tell them ahead of time not to wear these things. Because it's not just their procedure they're risking, it's everybody else's embryos that's in the system as well. Beware the harmful effects of third-hand smoke. That means if your staff go out for a smoke, they need to go back out into street clothes and come back in, but their hair will probably also carry the smoke as well. So ideally, they should not be smoking at all during normal working hours. Packaging materials have been exposed to the outdoor environment should never enter the ART suite. Cardboard is a source of fibers, particulates, dirt, and fungal spores. So the outer cardboard boxes that have been, the stuff's been shipped in, should never ever enter the lab. You can unpack those and take out the inner boxes 
into your entry area or even better still into the storeroom and then you unpack and just take the inner packages into the clean space. So we're going to minimize the passage of interior cardboard, paper packaging and, and in fact all of the paper that gets into your ART suite. There's concerns about off-gassing of VOCs from the materials that you use. All plastic culture waste should be off-gassed outside the lab if possible uh, while maintaining cleanliness and sterility of the products. Or you might create an off-gassing room, for example, in the lowest pressure area of your clean room suite so that the air that comes out of that room goes immediately into the reprocessing of the recirculated system. We don't know how long off-gassing takes. It's astonishing. We know it's it's a problem, um, but the studies have been hard to do because it's been hard to get hold of the instruments to do the studies. Uh, and the Cairo Consensus Group actually encouraged prospective studies to, uh, to understand this better. Uh, one of the suggestions is also that manufacturers should use breathable packaging so they would support off-gassing better. Important to remember that the operators, the staff themselves, are a significant potential source of VOCs and other contaminants. So when you're doing risk assessments of things, include the human aspect as well. The scrubs and other PPE that's selected uh, by facilities according to whatever policies they're using should be for the lab and procedure room, or so the whole of the ART suite, non-shedding, non-static and color stable under conditions used for their washing, drying and sterilization. So that obviously relates to scrubs. You don't usually wash your uh, hair covers and shoe covers. Although some people do use uh, cloth hair covers, if that's the case, then you've got to think about the appropriate ways of uh, washing and sanitizing those. Other things to think about is that photocopiers and laser, possibly inkjet printers, emit unwanted chemicals such as ozone, solvents, particulates, and the other particulates obviously for laser printers are, are toner dust. And so you should avoid their use within the ART suite. So if you're printing labels using a, a particular laser type printer, do it outside the ART suite. Don't have a photocopier because they use uh, the same toner. Don't have those inside the procedure suite. Think about the computers. Desktop computers emit VOCs and formaldehyde. Lower powered computers such as laptops generate less VOCs. Tablets and smartphones produce no or very limited amount of VOCs or aldehydes. So a minimum number of computers should be used in the ART suite and they should be switched off when not in use, particularly if they're tower type computers. If they're laptops, it's less of an issue, but you need to include this in a risk assessment. It's not an absolute, but you need to understand that these are a source of VOCs and potential harmful things to the embryos. So you need to understand them and design your systems having understood that and manage the risk appropriately. So you, every laboratory should take its own risk assessment regarding the use of computing equipment within the clean room. If you're buying new computers, particularly towers, they need to be off gas by running for 10 days outside the ART suite. And you could always test what's happening with those for the off gassing by using a, a VOC meter. Within the lab, you can remove VOCs by a range of technologies, uh, filtration using carbon and permanganate filters or, or photocatalytic oxidation, so PCO, or electrical plasma oxidation. Uh, so the two most common systems are the filtration ones, like the Kohler Tower. It has a maximum VOC re removal per pass, but it has a, a filters give it a high resistance to airflow, so you need larger fans, which makes it more expensive to buy it and run and noisier. Uh, the other thing to remember is that charcoal has a higher affinity to water vapor than it, does, than it does to VOCs. So if you use this in a humid environment, it will not work as you think. I actually have seen a situation where there were more VOCs coming out of a Coda tower than there were in the background air of the lab when it got to be very hot and sticky in a lab because it didn't actually have a proper HVAC system and they just had Coda towers to try and clean it. So these sorts of filters can release the VOCs they've absorbed if the, it gets hot and humid. The PCO technology, in this case, the uh, this is Zande 100C, which we, we've been using these or the similar machines now for, for 20 years. Uh, the VOCs are broken down progressive to CO2 and water vapor. There's negative res resistance to airflow and there's no sensitive to water vapor and they are relatively quiet in operation. The technology that's used in these uh, PCO systems like the Zandes, it, it's photocatalytic, so it uses UV light and a surface catalyst, which is titanium dioxide. So 
UV light is invisible to the human eye. If you see that blue light when things are turned on, that's just visible blue light. It just tells you the UV lamp is on. So UV lamps uh, have that blue light to show that they're working. If you go to the disco and you've got what's called black light, those types of, uh, of, uh, of uh, light sources only emit the UV. There's no blue background with it. So it is black, but the UV is still there. And you'll see that because people's white shirts glow. UV is adsorbed and not reflected by most surfaces. So it can't come out through the outlet grill. The wavelength used, 253.7 nanometers, destroys bacteria, viruses, and fungal spores. At this wavelength, you do not produce ozone. In fact, these, these, uh, this, this sort of technology actually adsorbs uh, any ozone that might be in the area. So it's very good. So ultraviolet light with, in conjunction with the titanium dark side produces uh, oxidizing hydroxyl radicals, and these will attack the VOCs, the bacteria, and the viruses. It'll destroy cells, inactivate viruses, and breaks down the, uh, the VOCs, as I said, ultimately to uh, uh, CO2 and water vapor. We've been using this sort of technology for many years, and we built a lab in Burnaby here in British Columbia in 2006. And it was a, a modest sized unit, not huge. Uh, and what we did is we put three of what were at that time called Zander 200C units. So they were like a double size unit compared to the floor standing one, but they're designed to fit inside the HVAC ducts. And we put, we thought we'd put three of those in series so that we'd maximize their performance. And you can see on the right here, the picture of these three, uh, these are the outside blue cases for the units before the units were themselves actually installed and power was provided and whatever. So we had three in direct series in the return air because in the return air that they've lost is lower so that there's more dwell times, so there's better uh, performance of the units. And we made measurements of VOCs after completion of construction and deep cleaning of the new facility. So VOC levels pre ZIFS, this is with the three Zander 200 units functioning in the HVAC, but the floor standing units not yet turned on. And this was literally only a couple of weeks after the, the builders left the space. And you can see that throughout the labs, we generally have low levels of VOCs, um, 150 parts per billion, so uh, 0.15 parts per million. Uh, in, the, in the cupboard, it was a bit higher. In these days, uh, well, this particular client chose to use uh, MDF constructed cabinetry uh, with zero VOC paint on all surfaces that weren't uh, coated. Um, but you can see it was still, uh, about 0.2 parts per million. So still very low levels. This is before the in lab ones were turned on. So the following week they were turned on. And you can see that the VOC levels now inside the embryology lab were literally, that after a day or two, down below 20 parts per billion. Uh, we know the lab was well isolated because they were actually varnishing uh, some woodwork out in the clinic lobby. And uh, that got to about 10 parts, parts per million in the air in the clinic lobby. So the system, the technology works very, very well for getting the VOC levels down. Um, as a result of that Burnaby experience, uh, Fred Zander developed the, uh, what's called the PCOC3, the Peacock3. And it's called that because it's got three chambers. So it's the same concept as we did in Burnaby, except the three chambers are mounted into the same housing and it's made even, even more efficient now as well. There are some uh, optional uh, or removable filters you can put here as well. Uh, it's a typical MERV 13 uh, filter. Uh, it's a standard, if you look at uh, this thing under ASHRAE, that's the American Society for Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineers. Um, ASHRAE will take you straight to their website via Google. Um, MERV 13 is a, is a, a filter that's approaching uh, HEPA levels. But it, they also include potassium, potassium permanganate, which will absorb any, any ambient aldehydes as well. Uh, we tested these units out in a recent uh, new build lab project. This was a huge space. The procedure su uh, suite was actually about 4,000 square feet, about 370 square meters. 
Uh, we use CARO consensus design principles and recommended ACH rates. Uh, this place was originally specified before the CARO consensus, um, so the overpressure was only set at about plus 30, and this, once the HVAC system was designed, there wasn't enough air to be able to get the overpressure any higher. A total of 11 of the Peacock 3 units were installed in the HVAC system in various places in the return air ducts. And upon occupancy, after completion of construction and deep cleaning, we had background we had VOCs measured before we brought the equipment in. And at that point, by independent validation engineer, by their testing instruments, VOCs were undetectable. And then with our own in-house testing using a PPB Ray 3000 plus unit, we were also not able to detect any, any VOCs in the system. Obviously, they, they did go up a bit as all the equipment and materials came in, but they well, then went down again as the system recovered from that. In terms of testing instruments that you should have, uh, you need to be able to test for particulates to make sure your HVAC system is functioning properly. Uh, the one we've been using for preference for quite a few years now is this one from a company called Lighthouse. It's handheld, it's lightweight, um, the particle range is, is exactly where we want. Uh, it, present, it does a, presents the particles by count or by mass concentration. And you can see on the display that it's a very simple uh, unit. Uh, you can uh, get attachments and store the data uh, in, on a computer and you can store some data internally. Um, but it's a, a good, effective unit. For VOC testing, as I said, we Use the PPB Ray 3000, now the 3000 Plus. Again, it's a handheld lightweight uh, device. It works on photo photoionization, so it's called a, a PID uh, device. And you, you know, wherever you wherever you point this, uh, the end of the uh, sensor probe, uh, and it will suck the air in, and it will tell you the VOC content. It'll, it has a range from one parts per billion to 10,000 parts per million. It has a, it's a huge range. But there's a trick. Calibration of these devices requires a high and a zero standard gas in order to scan the measurement, measurement range. The high is usually something like 10 parts per million, which for us is very high. And it might be a bit high if you can get one more like five, it's, it's better, but the high one is okay. But the zero gas that's usually supplied when you read the small print, it only guarantees to be less than 50 parts per billion. And since that's the area we really want to be in, you need to do an additional purification of your zero calibration gas. So we pass the gas, the zero calibrated gas, through a high efficiency hydrocarbon trap. And that hydrocarbon trap, and this one shown here, is about two foot six long. So about 70, 75 centimeters long, it's big. It has uh, standard quarter inch swage lock fittings on the end, so we can connect the piping to it. And that's the direction of flow, so the gas is connected to this end, and this end goes to the sampling uh, device of the uh, PPV Ray 3000. Um, this gas purification system, the hydrocarbon trap, is designed for purifying the vehicle gas for gas chromatographs. And obviously you want to get all the stuff out of it before you start trying to measure what you've uh, added in from your sample. And this device will achieve less than three parts per billion, which means that when we say our zero gas calibration is zero, it's actually less than three parts per billion. So our VOC detection limit will be three parts per billion. So we say, okay, it's undetectable. You wouldn't usually say zero, you'd say undetectable. And undetectable means it's less than three parts per billion. So take home message. The CARA consensus points, as given in that publication, should be considered as aspirational benchmarks for existing ART labs and as guidelines to the construction of new ART labs. The consensus provides recommendations. They're not requirements and they're not regulations and they're not intended to be used as such. If an IVF lab does not match these recommendations, it does not mean that it cannot be fit for purpose. Fitness is, is established by analysis of clinical outcomes. If clinical outcomes are considered adequate, it's fit for purpose as defined by the user. It's not just a matter of designing and building a new IVF lab. When you've designed it and you've built it, you've got to validate it. Everything's got to be serviced, maintained, and monitored routinely to ensure that your operational performance 
on an ongoing basis is as per specifications. You don't just build a unit and say, this is it, it's validated, it'll go forever. It needs to be monitored. If it's serviced and revalidated by a third independent third party company once a year, that's fine. But you, if something were to go wrong two weeks after one of those validation things, you wouldn't find out for another 50 weeks. And you'd be wondering why things were drifting or whatever, or you got more variability in your outcomes. That's why it's important to have these testing instruments available in-house. So for particulate, sorry, particulates and for VOCs, we recommend that every lab should have at least one of each of those so you can do this monitoring independently, regularly. With a new lab, you might do it more regularly than uh, more frequently than, than uh, once you've got the system better down, um, but we still would monitor, monitor at least weekly. And knowing what is happening in terms of the, the validation of uh, measurements from the air, air handling system would be part of a, of a normal uh, quality management meeting or even just a, just a, a quality uh, section of your lab meeting. You should know that things are working properly and that that possible source of uh, detrimental uh, effects on your system has is being controlled and is not a problem to be concerned about. So CARA consensus is published. It was published open access. It's easy for anybody to get to download a copy from the RBMO uh, website and uh, I recommend that anybody who's building, a, designing or building a, a lab or even just working in a lab, never mind running the lab, should certainly read it and be aware of all the points that relate to uh, keeping VOCs out of the lab. Thank you very much.